unpopular opinion, Canada is not real. It's just not a real thing. <laughs> now, before you shut this video off and leave a million and five angry comments, I implore you to watch the full length of this video and hear me out. You might even find yourself joining me in deep puzzlement, if not grave concern over why patriotism is even a thing. I'm going to be talking about patriotism specifically to settler colonial states today, but the insights can be extrapolated. You see, it was recently Canada Day, July 1st, so you can see how long it takes me to get out a video, but that was followed by July 4th in the US, and it's really just a strange week where seemingly normal, well-balanced people plaster themselves and whatever they own in colonial flags, get really drunk and post on social media about how proud they are to live in the best country in the world. Of course, people are saying this about various countries, the US is the best, Canada is the best, so the, the jury's out on how uh, official any of these rankings are, but people are really furiously invested in distinguishing their country from the rest and emphatically asserting that that country is the greatest. And as a result of these emphatic assertions of greatness, feeling themselves a deep sense of personal pride. Now, I can feel most of you frowning. I can feel defensiveness boiling up in your chest as you start commenting. Listen, you ungrateful little If you don't like it here, you can get the hell out. Put a pin in that, I'm gonna stop you right there and say that there is a huge cavernous difference between gratitude and pride. I am grateful every minute, every hour, every day, every year to have been born into a household, a city, a province, a country, a skin tone, a sexual orientation, you name it, that affords me such a high degree of privilege. That was pure chance. There are 7.5 billion people on this planet and I could have been any one of them. I could have been born into a very poor farming family in central Sulawesi. I could have been an orphan in Syria. Any of us could have. We had nothing to do whatsoever with where or how we were born. And so in effect, we could be anyone. So yes, I have a gratitude practice. I am eternally grateful that I have lived this privileged ass life because I know that I have not had to endure the hardships that far too many people in this world have. That was pure chance. And is that even true for everyone in Canada or the US? Do indigenous people really feel grateful to be living under this colonial capitalist system? Do poor or homeless people, do marginalized folks? Is it always so wonderful to live in the land of the free or the great white north? Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. And yes, you could argue that it is great to live here across the board in a sense, because it's better to be poor and marginalized here than it is to be poor and marginalized in Somalia or Bangladesh. But why? Why is that? What is it that affords us such privilege? And should we feel proud about that? Well, first of all, colonialism, as in genocide, as in ongoing cultural and literal genocide of indigenous peoples and the forced alienation of indigenous nations from their land bases so that these remain open for capitalist gain. That is what's afforded us the majority of our wealth as an economy historically based on resource extraction. Theft, pillage, murder. And no, this isn't just a event that happened in the past that we've somehow moved on from. We can't just make amends for stealing people's land and destroying their cultures and 
murdering them by just saying I'm sorry while we continue to do it and continue to benefit from all of this capitalist activity on their territories. As Glenn Coolhart says, this leads reconciliation to become temporally framed as the process of individually and collectively overcoming the harmful legacy left in the wake of this past abuse, while leaving the present structure of colonial rule largely unscathed. We have ongoing state-enforced military and police violence to make this possible, and again, ongoing slow violence and genocide. This is what our well-off cities and suburbs are built off of today. And not just colonialism at home, but neocolonialism and imperialism abroad, exploiting the countries of the global south for massive transfers of wealth and resources, often done through global financial institutions from which we benefit. And if you're thinking, no, no, that's not what I'm proud about. I'm proud about our democracy and our freedom as compared to all those other backwards countries. Well, first of all, we might have to dig a little bit more critically into that, but you'd probably and hopefully be not so proud to know that we, as in the West, as in North American countries in particular and other NATO allies, have forcefully installed innumerable dictators and repressive governments around the world so that they would give us their resources and open up their markets to predatory foreign multinationals. Watch any of my other videos to see the US's role in this, but Canada is also always complicit, either by supporting the US or by pillaging resources and exploiting people with our own multinationals like with our mining industry, for example, which is egregious. We know how destructive mining is around the world. I've talked about the Congo before and mentioned South America, but you might be surprised to know that 75% of the world's mining companies are Canadian. Eric Gold, anyone? They are well known for fatal shootings as well as hundreds of rapes gang rapes and beatings of indigenous women by the mine security forces, not to mention destroying the environments in which they live, and they only offer some compensation to victims on the agreement that they sign away all of their rights to ever legally sue. In the Congo in 2005, Anvil Mining Limited from Quebec allegedly provided logistical support and transportation to the Congolese military as it massacred hundreds of people in the port city of Kilwa. I'd characterize it as industry-facilitated massacre. The Canadian Association Against Impunity had their class action suit against this mining company thrown out by the Supreme Court of Canada, who said that this should actually be heard in the Congo, not in Canada. And so this is a great example of how our mining companies can act with complete impunity overseas with no threat of legal repercussions in Canada. When it comes to imperial coups and violence carried out around the world in our name, there is honestly too many to name at this point, but the point is that our democracy, and I mean, it's frankly hard to say that with a straight face anymore, but our democracy often comes at the direct expense of other people's democracy and freedom, and their forced wage servitude to mine our minerals, pick our fruit, and make our clothes for exorbitantly low prices in horrifically dangerous conditions. Does that fill you with pride? Does it feel super appropriate to be smashing those IM Canadian beer cans on our forehead and running around partying with this genocidal flag on our backs? Feeling pride is also quite puzzling when you think about the complete arbitrariness of the legal or illegal entities that we call countries. For example, Canada and the US are illegal colonial occupations. Leftists rightfully critique the colonial occupation of Israel, Palestinians should be liberated, from Standing Rock to Palestine, occupation is a crime. But I don't think we focus enough on the fact that we ourselves are living in one big colonial settlement, a settlement that defined itself as legal based on its own internal law. And it assumed that this law superseded all of the indigenous laws that were already governing the territory based on the racist assumption that indigenous peoples were just too primitive to hold actual sovereignty over their territories upon contact with Europeans. So, you know, their laws don't count. Our laws are the real laws because we say so. And because we've had the monopoly on violence for so long, that makes it right. We know this now and it's starting to be recognized in the courts, but it's not actually translating into any real difference on the ground. And so the charade continues, just pretending that we don't actually know that our legal system is not potentially legitimate at all. And so we can just keep partying. And even assuming Canada is legal, which is highly debatable, 
what even is it? It's a designated space around which we have drawn invisible, arbitrary borders. And by we, I mean a very small group of highly privileged white men. But we could have drawn these borders anywhere, right? I mean, there are clearly historical events and social reasons why the borders were drawn as they were, but they were socially determined. And very often they actually cut right through indigenous nations that found themselves now straddling this imposed invisible border. They were met by a wall of tear gas unleashed by heavily armed U.S. agents behind those coils of concertina wire. These children are in a detention camp held against their will, first in giant cages in this warehouse on the Texas border with Mexico. Teenagers wearing Make America Great Again hats, face to face with a Native American protester. The practice of bordering itself is always violent as it is forcefully including and excluding around a made up invisible line that's not natural or self-evident in itself, but a social construction. Most of the U.S.-Canada border itself is not marked by anything. It's literally just an invisible line that we have somehow all imagined separates us in some fundamental way from the people across that line, more so than we are separated from people within our city or province or country. So once these imaginary lines are drawn in place, the task of any wannabe government is to convince all of the extremely different people with different backgrounds, languages, political leanings, likes, dislikes, social positions, so capitalist landlords and workers alike, that we all have something fundamentally in common, that we all share. We're all united around one big imagined community, as Benedict Anderson calls it. And how do we do that? How do we get everyone to imagine the same thing? to imagine that this is not just a giant governing body with the monopoly on force and violence over each and every one of us so that we continue working and working to produce wealth for those at the top and so that they can control and extract resources from within the borders that they have defined at the whim of industry, contributing to the climate crisis that will bring us all down shortly. How do we convince people that that's not what this is? Well, we tell stories. We brand ourselves. And what a brand indeed. Everyone knows that we are all united around the mighty beaver and the moose. Hockey, everyone loves hockey. There isn't a single person who can call themselves Canadian and not love hockey. Maple syrup, I mean, who doesn't love that? Uh, we are polite. I certainly have never met a rude Canadian. Change my mind. And this is of course one of the symbols that's supposed to distinguish us from the US, which we are very anxious to do because frankly, what else do we really have to distinguish ourselves other than our socialized medicine? But Americans are rude, well, not us. It's a whole cultural phenomenon up here. And branching from this, we are tolerant, not like those belligerent Yankee, oh, oh no, oh no. Two in five respondents think Canada should stop taking in Syrian refugees immediately, and 57% said that Canada should not be accepting any more refugees from anywhere. 24% said too many immigrants are visible minorities. Huh. The poll results come just days after a Calgary school was vandalized with the message, Syrians go home and die. Boy, if that doesn't fill you with the warm fuzzies, you must not be a real Canadian. Uh, canoes, totem poles, yeah, that's, that's not appropriate at all. You know, the colonizers loved canoes and totem poles before they came out and wiped out indigenous nations, you know, so. <sighs> And also the flag that we plaster on our faces and everywhere, the most powerful symbol of our shared Canadianness, is actually only a bit more than 50 years old. Before that time we were using this, which I'm sure most Canadians have never seen, and it was unofficial because not all the provinces were even incorporated because we're not really that united. Even today, West and East aren't really united, but Anyway, pretty compelling stuff, right? Pretty strong, non-arbitrary at all symbols to unite around, regardless of background or socioeconomic status. All internal contradictions, all class struggle, just erased by the mighty leaf. Canada is like one big corporation that has to continually advertise to you about what it is and why you need it. Yeah, you know all those other countries that we are actively complicit in exploiting and destroying? Well, you should be thankful and proud that you live here and not over there. Honestly, this branding is just so prevalent and it really targets you as an individual to make you think that, well, 
if you identify as a Canadian or an American or whatever country we're talking about, and that country is great, then by extension, you are great too. So you can feel satisfaction about that. It's one big ego boosting campaign to distract us from ongoing colonialism, from capitalism, creating increasing inequality and degraded working and living conditions, from rising xenophobia and racism and sexism and transphobia and homophobia, etc. that is marginalizing a huge swaths of our population. And that's a problem. People are out there celebrating this made up thing because it's fun and it's fun to feel a sense of belonging, but it's taking pride in the privilege of living here while totally disavowing and obscuring how it is that we actually have those privileges. And it can really only be fun and lighthearted with this intense, uncritical disavowal, right? It can't really be fun if you take any time at all to really think about what it is that you're celebrating and what kind of structures you're upholding and perpetuating. And if you take a look at the hardened, self-proclaimed Canadian patriots of today, like Pegida, the anti-Islam group, the Northern Guard, the soldiers of Odin, the sons of Odin, the wolves <laughs> of, of what? Of what? Uh, uh, of Odin, of Odin. They take this fun disavowal to a terrifying extreme. For them, Canadian branding is explicitly white. So you can't enjoy canoeing or maple syrup as a Pakistani, that's out of the question. But you know, they're, they're not wrong about that branding. This country is founded on white supremacy and the immigration laws up to the 1960s reflect that. And current attitudes of people towards non-white immigrants and refugees reflect that too. Never mind that people who are today coded as white were once discriminated against as ethnic others in this very country, like the Irish, like the Italians, like the Ukrainians, etc., etc. But this is this part of the fun disavowal. Let's not let's not think too hard about the contradictions involved here. But because of the immigration issue, self-proclaimed patriots also hate Justin Trudeau. And it's funny because they don't actually realize that leftists are also very critical of Trudeau, but for like principled reasons, like the fact that he's running roughshod over indigenous rights and pushing through a pipeline when we only have 10 years to turn around climate change. But anyway, patriots hate the Canadian government. They hate large swaths of people who actually live here, who are Canadians, who just don't look like them and don't act the way that they want them to. So what is it that they actually love or are so proud of? Is it the land itself that they don't steward and in fact their ancestors and mine were responsible for destroying it and blocking Indigenous nations from leading us into right relationship with the land and with each other, you know? People are invested in a dream, in a fantasy. And I know that I'm probably not going to reach the real hardened wolves of Odin with this video, but I'm hoping to reach liberals who do care about this stuff and who do care about indigenous rights to perhaps just think a little bit more critically about this and what it's for and where it leads. And honestly, I love Ontario. I really do. I love the land, I love the forest, I feel very deeply connected to many places in this province. And I'm a vegan environmentalist, but frankly, I don't steward this land in a really meaningful way. I'm part of the colonial capitalist system of my ancestors that is destroying it. And while I'm very grateful to be here, that doesn't fill me with pride. And my person, my center, my core, uh, who I am as a living being, as an animal on this earth, does not need to be attached to this external made up thing. I don't get any validation from that. I don't need to feel any sense of accomplishment over where I was born, which I had absolutely nothing to do with. I don't have to get offended when people point out the flaws of this country. When indigenous people say that Canada Day is a celebration of indigenous genocide, I don't have to be hurt. I mean, I should be hurt in, in a very deep way in terms of, wow, you know, how painful a, a legacy and a history that I'm a part of, but I don't have to be personally offended by that. I don't have to get defensive about that. I don't have to make that a personal insult to me because 
I don't have to attach this fantasy of Canadianness so strongly to my person to the point that I can't even acknowledge historical fact without having my feelings hurt. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's something that we need to grapple with and fix. And beyond our borders, you know, I don't need a border to tell me who to have more empathy with and who to have less empathy with. So when we're sending Canadians over in these ridiculous, illegal, destructive, disgusting wars based on lies in the Middle East for money, for profit, for oil, I don't have to feel more connection with the soldiers that are doing that than I do with the people who are bearing the brunt of that, right? These borders are made up. We could be anyone. And some people commented on Twitter, you know, what if we reclaim patriotism? What if patriotism is actually what Chelsea Manning did, right? What if loving this country is actually risking everything and fighting to make it a better place? Well, first of all, those are the arguments of people who are deeply patriotic today. Maybe they're not invested in making it a better place for everyone, but they certainly view themselves as fighting for the good of the country to make it a better place, whatever that means. So it can be so easily co-opted. And I think that part of that stems from the fact that a country is always made up a state. It's always made up. It's always a governing body that's enforcing a certain political economy through force, through a monopoly on violence. And historically, it's always changing, it's always shifting. So I'm not sure that we should ever really be pledging allegiance to these abstract entities, but rather concretely to each other and to emancipation and to communities and extending our community and our community of empathy as, as far as possible. Because there are things that can unite us that don't actually have to do with arbitrary bullshit like maple butter like justice and empathy and compassion and sincerity and solidarity and generosity and mutual aid and mutual respect and commitment to one another. These things are universal and they're all that really matter. You know, it's 2019. The Truth and Reconciliation Report has been out for years now. The mask is off. We know that, we get it. Even the mask of capitalism is off to a large extent. So. This is Turtle Island, y'all. As settlers, we have responsibilities to the indigenous nations that we actually inhabit. We really don't need to keep participating in this fantasy that keeps us accepting what the ruling classes are doing in our name and keeps us perpetuating this damaging idea of a legitimate Canadian claim to this territory and authority to do whatever the hell it wants in it. This is not as benign as it seems, and frankly, we know where it leads. Special thanks to Jose for his angry comments. Check out his channel. Special thanks to Tristan from Step Back History for editing this video. Check out his channel. And special thanks to Will Jarvis for the musical talent in this video. Check out his Bandcamp and Spotify. Shout out to Rob McNeil and Jennifer Yu for being dope patrons and comrades. And to all of my patrons, I could not do this without you. If you could spare even $1 per month, you can help contribute to the continuation and the growth of this channel, and I very much appreciate it. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in another video.